a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words from Scripture. Let love be sincere. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another as family. Lead the way in showing honor to one another. In zeal, not idle, fervent in spirit, serving the Messiah. In hope, rejoice. In suffering, endure. In prayer, persevere. Take part in meeting the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not think highly of yourself. Sit with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but Contemplate what is good in the sight of all persons. If possible for you, live peaceably with all. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved. Rather, leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Holy One. On the contrary, if your enemies hunger... Feed them. If they thirst, give them drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Be not overcome by evil. Rather, overcome evil with good. For the word of God in its promise and covenant. Thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Calm, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if we embody charity with justice, then nothing else matters. And if we do not embody charity with justice, then nothing else matters. Inspire us now with your love, the love that excels every other love. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, our path and pattern. Amen. Shortly after moving to Ohio five years ago, this very weekend, I learned that Ohio State University would soon enter a three-year legal battle to trademark one of the most common words in the English language, the three-lettered definite article, the. Usually, when that word precedes a consonant, we pronounce it the. But when it comes before a vowel sound, we say the, as in the Ohio State University. Technically speaking, there are 14 Ohio State Universities. Bowling Green, Kent, Cleveland, Youngstown, just to name a few. However, there is one and only one Ohio State University, and that is the Ohio State University. The is what we call a definite article. A and an are what we call indefinite articles. Definite and indefinite articles make all the difference in the world. Now, don't go try this, but let's say, for example, you approached a Buckeye alum and asked, did you attend an Ohio State University? (laughs) Mm -mm. You might want to run for cover because the loyal graduate might respond saying, I attended the Ohio State University. Thus is the difference between definite and indefinite articles. In June of last year, the Ohio State University won its legal battle, and the United States Patent and Trademark Office approved OSU's application for the, specifically for use on branded products like T-shirts and 
baseball caps. Now, but before I'm charged with making a mountain out of a molehill, I want to say that the definite article, the, played a role when I announced that you had called me as your pastor. My Facebook official post read something like this. The Washington Avenue Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Elyria, Ohio, has called me as its next senior minister. Did the definite article really matter? Well, there are actually two congregations with the name Washington Avenue Christian Church, one of which is in Amarillo, the other, well, the other you know. Not wishing to confuse some of my Texas friends who live in the panhandle, I chose to specifically name you. I could have said, a church called me, or Washington Avenue called me, but no. I wanted to single you out as the Washington Avenue Christian Church. When we read English translations of Scripture, we often miss the definite articles that appear in the Greek. Usually, these articles are not necessary, or that is what translators have chosen for us to think. In the Gospel of John, however, the evangelist talks about disciples, Thomas and Philip, but when the gospeler quotes Jesus, he includes the definite article in front of Jesus' name, the, as a definite article, indicates specificity. The Jesus, not a Jesus, not any old Jesus, because any old Jesus just will not do. For the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, it's the Jesus. Paul, whom we will not call the Paul, because we know that would go straight to his head, uh, wrote the letter to the Romans. He is deeply committed to the thriving of this budding religious community. In Romans, Paul uses the word y'all, so we know he is urging not individuals, but an entire group of people who have chosen to do life and faith with and alongside one another to pursue the reign of God, the kingdom of God on earth. Some of my most favorite and a couple of my least liked scriptures occur in Romans. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the live long day. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than victorious through the one who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Without the definite article, imagine how powerless the verse would sound. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through someone, anyone who loved us. No, the one, the Jesus, because any other Jesus just will not do. In the beginning of Romans 12, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, kindred, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable. And perfect. I have loved this verse since my preteen years in vacation Bible school, but I love it more today than I did back then. To be transformed is not something we can affect or accomplish ourselves. It is something that happens to us. In the Greek, the verb for be transformed is metamorphosis, be metamorphosized. 
Paul knew, I think, that we, the people, cannot transform or metamorphosize ourselves. Instead, we must be like the caterpillar who cocoons and then transforms into a butterfly. Such transformation is Paul's great hope for the church in Rome. I got, I got even more curious about that verse this morning. I mean, a morning, any morning, some glad morning. And I read the verse again, this time in the Greek. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that you may discern what is the desire of God, what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. Not just any good will do. It has to be the good, the acceptable, the perfect. That is what God desires. To me, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect sound a lot like love. Most of us are familiar with what Paul wrote about love. I'd be willing to bet that the most popular passage of Scripture used at weddings is 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I love that. Pun intended. And I bet you do too. However, the translation with which we are familiar is missing something. A three-lettered word a definite article. The love is patient. The love is kind. The love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. The love. It never ends. For Paul, not just any love will do. It must be the love. In writing his letter to the Romans, Paul has had time to think about love, so he writes, the love genuine or the love sincere. Translators often supply a verb here at the expense of the definite article. Let love be sincere. But, but that could be any love. Heretofore in Romans, Paul has spoken about the love of God, but now Paul flips the script. The love sincere, the love genuine is to be the distinctive quality of all believers. Though this translation is clunky, here's a more direct rendering of what Paul wrote. The love genuine, abhorring the, or the evil, cleaving to the good. The love of which Paul speaks requires decisive action, for the love can never be weak resignation for what good, any good, would any old love be able to do. It has to be the love. Paul goes on to encourage his hearers to live and love as kindred, to anticipate showing forth respect in the hope rejoicing, Paul says, in the suffering enduring, in the prayer persevering. The hope, the suffering, the prayer, not just any hope or suffering or prayer, but it is the hope that inspires our rejoicing. It is the suffering that gives rise to our enduring. It is the prayer that keeps us persevering no matter what. Take part in meeting the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality, Paul says. Another translation I like chooses, contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek out opportunity to show forth hospitality. Truly, Paul's exhortation to practice charity is commendable, and yet we must go beyond charity and demand justice that will bring everlasting peace. 
When looking for quotes for the worship guide this week, I found Dom Helder Kamara, a distant historical figure to Christians under the age of 50. Dom Helder was a Brazilian Roman Catholic archbishop who championed the poor. In his first message to his diocese, he proclaimed, although for some people it may appear strange, I declare that here in the Northeast, Christ is called Jose Antonio Severino. Behold the one. Here is Christ, the human, the human being who needs justice, has rights to justice, deserves justice. Dom Helder had the vision of Matthew 25 in which Jesus said, Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. If Dom Helder still isn't ringing a bell, you may know his most famous quote. When I feed the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why so many people are poor, they call me a communist. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, says the Jesus. One year ago, Washington Avenue Christian Church took on an effort to abolish oppressive medical debt for people of Lorain County and Ohio. To this day, I still cannot comprehend that we abolished some $2.452 million in medical debt throughout our county and state. What we did last year resulted in a new connection with the Reverend Dr. Jawanza Colvin and the Greater Cleveland Congregations, an organization that is here today as a participant in our outreach fair. In April of this year, Reverend Dr. Colvin invited me to speak to Greater Cleveland Congregations about how we did it. In the conversation that followed, one person asked me, what do you know now that you didn't know when you started the effort? What a great question. I told the story of a person who called the church asking about our work to abolish medical debt. He understood some of the news reports to say that we had local funds to help individuals with their medical bills. My my heart sank a bit as I, I told him how RIP medical debt works and that there was no way for me to make sure that his debt was abolished. Our work to cancel medical debt will forever be one of the things of which I am most proud. But if I had to do it over again, I would pair our work of charity with a question. Why are so many people consumed by medical debt? What is it with our capitalist, profit-driven healthcare and insurance systems that make healthcare the number one cause of financial ruin in our country? I wonder, though, if such, such questions would result in us being called saints or communists. Today, we are celebrating our partnership with several organizations throughout Northeast Ohio who are doing good, justice-centered, justice-making, justice-creating work. Take a look at the back of your worship guide, and you'll see a list of organizations who are here. I cannot wait until the end of the outreach fair when we'll announce our current total of funds for community and congregational outreach that our outreach committee will distribute in the coming months. And yet, with our very good work of charity, I'm growing increasingly curious about how to enact charity with justice. It is good and right that we should financially support partnering organizations. 
We will be called saints, I'm sure. And we must wonder aloud about the systems and structures of our culture and world that exist and persist to this day that continue to prey on people, especially those who are marginalized and minoritized. So, for example, I, I see a church that is willing to live in charity and steadfast love and do justice on behalf of the oppressed. I see a church that petitions elected officials for health care coverage and the continued expansion of Medicaid. I see a church that is unequivocal in its proclamation that black lives matter and continues to interrogate systemic racism and terminate white privilege and supremacy. I see a church that is passionately committed to the thriving of God's LGBTQIA plus children of the rainbow, which means that we must tell the truth that self-harm among that population is an indictment first and foremost on the church. I see a church that is passionate about making sure that persons have access to gender affirming care. And while we're at it, let's not forget that reproductive justice is a tenet of the gospel too. I see a church that is passionate about destigmatizing mental health care and prioritizing it as whole body care. I see a church that can build beds for children and then raise holy you know what to demand a livable minimum wage. I see a church that values the beauty of trees and protests when capitalist interests would pave paradise to put up a parking lot. I see a church willing to risk something big for something good. I see that church. Do you see it too? Not everyone will go with us. Even in preparation for this outreach fair, we received a response from an organization we invited and have financially supported saying, um, you're not a fit for us. I have to be honest with you that that response stings as much now as it did the day when it arrived. But we can keep going Paul has something for us here to bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. We are not to repay evil for evil, but trust that God in God's own way will settle the score. Charity with justice is a tall order for the 21st century church. Can we do it? Will we make it? Well, my friends, have you ever heard of the Jesus? He is the one sent by God to show us the way to the abundant life. He acted with charity, feeding those who were impoverished, healing those who lived with disease and dis-ease. He understood that hope was a state of the mind independent of the state of the world. He discovered that when his heart was full of the hope, not just any old hope, but the hope that he could be persistent when he could not be optimistic. He kept the faith despite the evidence, knowing that only so doing does the evidence have any chance of changing, of being transformed, of being metamorphosized. Jesus was a threat to Rome. He agitated imperial structures and systems so much so that they hung him up on a cross. I'm sorry. The cross. I think they would have called him a communist. But oh, my friends, no nails, no cross, no grave can keep the Jesus. For the resurrection tells us that the love's redeeming work is done. What does the love do? It acts with charity and with justice. And when the love is embodied, do you know what it looks like? I'm telling you that the love looks like Jesus. And I think now, perhaps more than ever before, the love could look like 
the Washington Avenue Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Elyria, Ohio, may the redeeming work of the love be done through us from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah and amen.